on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by First Fidelity Bank. We're joined by Ralph Russo. Ralph is the lead college football writer for the Associated Press. With the preseason AP poll and All-American teams being released this week, Ralph is essentially the most popular man in college football right now. Before Ralph's interview, we jump into local college football news. Lincoln Riley's comments caused quite a reaction this week. OU banned tailgating, and we look at the OU and OSU players that were named preseason All-Americans. We wet the beak and look at some NBA odds. We give you our winners and losers of the week and discuss a new exciting attraction in Oklahoma City in keeping it local. Please download and subscribe to the podcast. Rate it five stars and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right. My man Michael Hostie will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Thursday, August 27th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Lehman, presented by First Fidelity Bank. First Fidelity Bank is a full-service financial institution based in Oklahoma with tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs. Checking accounts, savings accounts, home loans, and much more. They do it all, whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone. Everything is stress-free with FFB. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts couldn't be easier. First Fidelity Bank provides free ATMs worldwide, making banking convenient wherever you are. And how about these offers for new customers? If you open a new checking account or savings account, they give you $200. If you open both a new checking and savings account, they give you $500 free money, ladies and gentlemen. They also give back to the community. FFB donates a total of more than $500,000 to local charities and educational foundations. Make your life easier and go bank with First Fidelity Bank. Visit ffb.com for more information. Now, we're recording this on Wednesday night. We were supposed to record it right after game five of the Rockets and Thunder series. And, well, uh, that game didn't happen, Ted. Uh, it did not uh, – that, that game did not take place. So, our normal raw emotional immediate reaction, we don't have that for the people we just uh yeah it didn't happen well it did not happen uh the real question is is it going to happen that is that <laughs> is, is certainly going to that is certainly the big question and we're going to get into that uh during wet the beak when we talk some nba odds we also we've got a great interview with ralph russo from the Associated Press. Ralph is the head college football writer there at the AP. So with the All-American teams and obviously the AP Top 25 for the preseason coming out, I think some people have some questions about the way they did some things. So I figured I'd go straight to the source. So we've got a great interview for you guys with Ralph. So yeah, this is going to be a good one. Uh, kind of a historic day in sports. So, yeah, this is interesting. It's it's just kind of kind of a weird vibe in the sports world right now, right? Well, there's been a number of days like this over the last six months. They've all been a little bit different, but it's one of those where you you kind of show up, you know, like today. I showed up expecting to do my radio show over topics X, Y, and Z, and ended up not hitting any of those and just kind of watching breaking news and um, watching some of the stuff that's going out, kind of speculating like where it's going to go from here. Is it going to, is it going to spread? Is it going to go to other sports? What, what happens tomorrow? And it's, we've seen some of those, you know, a lot of it's been coronavirus related. This one is, is a separate issue, but oddly enough, we've kind of, grown accustomed to that this year that there's going to be days like this spread throughout yeah well thank goodness for local college football news yeah because we still have it baby and local college football news is brought to you by will and wiley hard seltzer guys stop acting like you're too manly and just accept it hard seltzers are amazing and there's only one hard seltzer that we drink on this podcast and that is will and wiley hard seltzer from coop aleworks 
It's perfect for any occasion. We drink it by the pool, at the lake, and at the tailgate or not. We'll get to that. It's made in Oklahoma, and it's absolutely delicious. Will & Wiley is customized for the Oklahoma lifestyle. Go find it right now in the store near you, and go follow them on social media at, at Will & Wiley. If you're drinking some because of us, tag us in your social media posts to let them know. All right, let's get to the Oklahoma football news first. Coronavirus numbers for the team were released, and they said that they had 17 active cases. But then Lincoln Riley comes out on Tuesday, said that they have got eight or nine of those guys back from quarantining and that they were, quote, definitely under 10 active cases. So that seems like positive news that not obviously not positive that those kids were diagnosed with the virus, but that they were healthy enough past all the screening to get back on the field. And Teddy, I don't, I don't know about you, but it seems like, and, and I don't want to make it sound like this is, it, it's been normalized or anything like that, but it seems like people locally are getting more used to seeing positive tests and we're not seeing as severe of a reaction when these things are happening. Is that just me or is that kind of how you see it as well? No, I, I mean, I think that's, I think that's pretty generally the case. Um, and it's not just whenever it comes to football teams releasing numbers. I think that's kind of whenever it comes to anyone release, releasing numbers, whether it's your state or local government or your local football or, or basketball team. It's just, it's been hammered home so much now that, you know, I think everyone is starting to maybe, you know, just kind of push it away a little bit or block it out. But I tell you, um, you know, one of the interesting things and interesting reasons I think that it's been normalized is because the Big 12, SEC, ACC have basically shown since they reported in June, it's like, We've had positive tests here, there, sometimes large amounts, sometimes none. They're marching through. It's like there's, there's been no deterrence. I know that you've seen a couple of places in some of those conferences shut down uh, briefly, but they've shown the resolve that, yeah, uh, we're going to deal with this. We're going to keep going, and positive tests, you know, we're going to treat them properly. We're going to quarantine. We're going to isolate. We're going to contact trace, but – we're going to keep rolling on. And I think once people realize that, it quit being such a big issue because, you know, there was a while whenever it was like, oh, they had seven tests. Is this it? Are they going to say they're this done? This is where it all comes crumbling to the ground. <laughs> now we learned is... that Oklahoma uh, essentially had a, a, an entire position group wiped out, and that didn't slow them down. It didn't, didn't change their approach. On they go. Yeah, and – yeah, that statement from Lincoln Riley certainly got the biggest reaction publicly, social media, when he said that they did have that position group that had all but one guy that had to sit out because of round of COVID testing. I mean, and I, I understand, but maybe I don't. I, I understand people being a little surprised, I guess, but also part of me – wonders like what did you think was going to happen in locker rooms like do people understand that guys in the same position group they live together they hang out together they're obviously in close proximity to each other on the practice field maybe not in the meeting room I know a lot of schools including Oklahoma still doing a bunch of stuff virtually but these guys are around each other all the time so if one guy tests positive, then when you factor in the contact tracing or the close contact, whatever term you want to use, then a lot of guys are going to have to sit out because you're going to have a large number of guys that have to isolate. I mean, that number grows quickly. So I was a little surprised that people were so shocked by this, like, oh, <gasps> oh, you almost had a whole position group? I was like, well, yeah, that, that makes the most sense. It would be weirder if it was a guy from like six different position groups. Totally random. Yeah, that, that would worry me more. 
Well, um, well, yeah, because if you if you've got it from six different position groups, then all of a sudden you've got to look inside those position groups for who to isolate and quarantine because, you know, it's not always this way, but. You know, a lot of times offensive line lives with offensive line, defensive line lives with defensive line. So it doesn't take, but let's say you've got, you know, two or three different guys in a position group. Let's say if it was the defensive line, you've got two guys that test positive and, you know, they live with two other defensive linemen and the other guy lives with two other defensive linemen. Now all of a sudden you're talking about six guys because of contact tracing that are out. I mean, a lot of people, we've talked about this before, but for those that don't know exactly how that works, if you test positive, your teammates, regardless of what they test, they are done. Isolation instantly, they, uh, they go into self-isolation. So that's how it goes. And the term – and now that I see the term, we, we're starting to see the term isolation a lot more because it's, I don't know if it just sounds better than quarantine. Well, I think quarantine is, at least this, you could tell me. This is there a the difference? Way. I, I, seriously, I have no idea. Is there a difference? I, the way I have at least treated it, this could be, someone may tell me that you're an idiot. No, teach me something, Ted. Teach me something, bud. I believe that, or I've treated it as quarantine is whenever you've tested positive and you are totally cut off. Isolation, self-isolation is whenever you've been in contact with someone that has tested positive and you're distancing yourself to wait and see if for another test result or something? Yeah, yeah, a test result or just to wait until the – To see if you start feeling awful. Passed. Yeah, <laughs> like, like the 10 – I think there's like a – I mean, didn't we say that it was 14 day, 10 days for a positive test and 14 for uh, – it was like backwards. It was more for a, a person that was just self-isolation that was contact tracing. Yeah, when that came out and we were – I'm still confused about that, and we well, certainly make, were confused I mean, when it, The reason it's like that is because the incubation incubation period, at least at one time, was rumored to be up to 14 days. I, I do have a question for you now that you just said the term incubation period. When you got into sports journalism, sports talk, did you think you were going to be dropping incubation period a lot in your career? Uh, no, I did not. And I just called you a journalist. <laughs> yeah, don't ever do that again, dude. <laughs> Shit, don't, you gave me the craziest look when I said journalism. I did not. Um, however, when I, I, this is kind of funny. On my, on my radio show, this is way back in December, whenever the deal first started in, in China, I, I used to do this segment. I still do the segment where it's things that caught my eye. And every single day, I would do a coronavirus update and how it is spread and everything. This is all the way back in, this is before we left for the Peach Bowl. So um, it's kind of a running joke that, uh, you know, at the station that I was studying it, I was the conspiracy theory way before anyone else. So um, I've got a little bit, just like maybe a month or two longer of epidemiology than anyone else around here. <laughs> well, Ted, something that, Caught a lot of people's eye this week was when Lincoln Riley named a starting quarterback, right? Did Just I miss kidding. it? Just oh, kidding. Okay. He didn't do okay. that. He, he, he would never. He would never do that. Um, but he, he did say – he had some complimentary things to say about Spencer Rattler and Tanner Mordecai. He didn't name a starter. I don't know when he will name a starter because there's nothing normal about the season so normally we'd expect it sometime next week but he said that they're both playing well they're in a good place mentally uh going to continue to evaluate both guys now i'll say this spencer rattler has had every chance to separate himself in this quarterback competition with the amount of practice that tanner mordecai has had to miss so I wonder if that will be too much for Mordecai to overcome. But I don't know because next week we could find out. But, Teddy, are you expecting him to name a starter 
like before the first game because I could see Lincoln, he already doesn't like naming a starter anyways. I could see him just taking it right up to the day before the game or something crazy like that. I, I just don't – I don't know what to expect, man. It Everything's weird. No, I it would not shock me at all if he never officially names a starter. Wouldn't shock me at all. Um, a lot of times, you know, Lincoln knows that he holds the cards. Um, teams out there are, I mean, everyone's factoring in. I imagine their their opponents that Spencer Rattler is going to be the quarterback, but they don't know. And when they right. don't know, it can be a little bit more difficult to maybe uh, build exactly what you think your game plan is going to be. And obviously all that stuff is going to change as the season rolls on. But Lincoln, it seems like his stance has always been, well, if I don't have to give anyone any information about us, why would I? So, you know, it wouldn't shock me if, if he doesn't name a starter. You know, I People I, will love that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, here's the thing is because of the way it's gone with – You can't with really Baker question Tyler, the guy. Well, the way it's gone with, with Baker and Kyler and then, you know, with, with – with Kyler and Austin Kendall, just the way that everything has gone where the fan base has been sold on these quarterback battles, but there's never really been a battle there, at least in their minds. It's like, I think a lot of it anymore just kind of falls on deaf ears. It's like, I think everyone, whenever Spencer Rattler came in for the Peach Bowl at the end, I think everyone said whether this was a calculated move by Lincoln Riley or not, I don't know, but it's all anyone wanted to talk about after that game. Everyone made up their mind right then that Spencer Rattler is going to be the starter, and it really doesn't matter what we're told or sold from this point on. So I just think a lot of people have tuned it out, and just he's the de facto starting quarterback. Right. Well, ultimately, this is where I land on it. I'm just going to let Lincoln Riley do his thing. You know, I, it may frustrate some people, but I trust the guy to pick the right guy. I, I really do. Uh, the proof is in the pudding. I'll tell you what's funny. Um, Toby Rowland, I guess he did some type of preview show or something that's going to air on maybe Fox or something with Lincoln Riley. And um, he said that whenever they started talking about quarterback, the first quarterback that he talked about was Chandler Morris. And it was like gushing over Chandler Morris. And then Toby goes on and lists some names. And I'm like, this is all like disinformation. I mean, it's all disinformation with Lincoln Riley's giving you. Psychological warfare from Lincoln. So then I talked to someone that I would consider to be very much in the know. And I was kind of laughing about that. And I was like, well, when they were talking about quarterback, you know, apparently he was talking about Chandler Morris and this guy says, Oh my God, he's got a freaking rocket. So I was like, Oh, well, you know, I don't expect obviously him to factor into the, uh, the race. You heard it here first Chandler Morris starting quarterback. I I was just like, I was, I was shocked for that to be in any way corroborated or at least like, you know, talked about, I, I just thought it was going to be, yeah, uh, whatever. But no, the first thing I got is like, oh my God, he's got a rocket. So at least he's, you know, getting some opportunity that maybe he wouldn't have had otherwise. So yeah, I mean, that's I what happens. That funny. That's what happens when guys miss practice, right? You got to make yeah. the most of your opportunity if you're Chandler Morris and you know, let that thing rip. Now we did hear from Bill Bedenboe and Roy Manning this week and said some good things about some individual guys. Bo had some good things to say about Adrian Ely. Can you believe he mentioned him playing left tackle? Uh, that's Shocking. weird. Shocking, huh. Gabe. Huh. Hmm. If only there was a podcast that had mentioned that. <laughs> huh. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, it's almost like, like you're saying, calling the shots, Gabe. It's almost like I talked to Bill Beanbo. <laughs> it's uh, very excited about the depth at, at the offensive line and – I did talk to Bedenbo about an interesting thing because, you know, I was just kind of picking his brain on how he was approaching the offensive line situation. And he, he basically told me he has to have every guy ready to play. 
and uh, you, we, we just saw it with LSU's offensive line, right? That can happen quickly. So you have to have every guy in that room ready to go. True freshman, redshirt junior, doesn't matter. They all got to be ready to play because you don't know what a round of COVID testing is going to deliver maybe the day before the game, right? We're talking about three tests per week, one right before the game. Like, so, and I never heard, he, he very much now, he, he develops guys at a high level. Obviously, you, you see what he's done over the last couple of years at Oklahoma. But, yeah, he was very candid. Hey, I got to have every single guy in this room ready to go. And I was like, that doesn't seem easy, but good luck, pal. Well, I mean, it reminds me of, so we used to make fun of Mangino, like in our walkthrough on Friday, you know, whenever you're doing substitutions and call outs, um, Mangino in his loud voice would say, like, I can't remember the exact situation, but it'd be like, okay, Vince is down at center. Skins, Mike Skinner, Skins, move down to center. Uh, Wes, you're now at guard. Jamal, go to left or go to right tackle. And then so it's like whenever someone went down, like the Musical center goes chairs. down, everyone just like swapped positions so one other guy could come in. And that was before they had a ton of depth. But because of the situation, I imagine that you know, it's like, hey, Creed, why don't you go play guard this this couple of plays? Or, you know, go someone that doesn't play tackle, go get a couple of reps at tackle. I mean, just to make sure that if some of those guys have at least, you know, I know they're all in the room and get the coaching points on all of it, and you've got to absorb some of that. But you got to make sure that everyone kind of has an understanding of every position. I mean, that's kind of always been – an offensive line thing anyways, right? Yeah. I mean, you got to be able to play all the positions. Uh, now there's only a certain number of guys that can snap the football because that is an acquired skill. I'm just saying, but yeah, it was good to hear Bill talk about having four or five guys that he thinks he could play at left tackle. You know, several guys he thinks he can play at right tackle said it's the deepest they've ever been in the interior. So the offensive line, I feel great about Oklahoma's offensive line. I really do. Roy Manning had some good things to say about Trey Brown. I think Trey Brown, I think he's been ultra motivated this offseason. Yeah. I, I really do. And I think that he is, he's really improved as a player. It, it seems like he's more determined than ever. You just see the stuff he puts out on social media, right? This dude's got a chip on his shoulder, Ted. Well, I mean, and I think I, I mentioned this on one of the one of the first podcasts that we have that you know I had talked to Grinch like and this is like way back in February when they were just doing their winter workouts and just kind of like hey how the guys look and he's like dude the mindset's completely different he said Trey Brown is a different guy so you know what that means come fall uh, on the field I don't know but attitude attitude means a lot in football. It really does. Attitude, confidence, chip on your shoulder. Uh, when you're out to prove the world wrong, you show up a little bit different on just a random Wednesday than you might if uh, you're really comfortable in your position in the world. So I think he's set up to have a good year. Now, at the same time, I, you know, I wouldn't say that anything in the defensive secondary is set in stone. Right. Um, I think that you, you may see – and Trey Grinch, Norwood may play five different positions this year. Yeah, yeah, and that's true. And if some of the younger guys start to come around at corner like they had hoped, uh, you know, Trey's been playing quite a bit of corner here, then maybe they move him to nickel and maybe they start moving some other pieces around. But uh, I, think they're, I think they're starting to get a lot of buy-in. And, you know, whenever you're a freshman and you're learning the defense at the same time as a senior – like talking about last year, it goes a little bit differently. Whenever you're a freshman and you're coming in and everyone else on the team has a great understanding of the defense and you're standing over there watching and the guy you're standing next to says, well, yeah, you're supposed to be here, here, and here. And when you get this release, this is where you need to be. And with this motion, and there's, there's not a lot of guys standing around with a blank 
stare on their face like there can be whenever everyone's learning it for the first time. And I think the entire level gets raised much quicker whenever like new guys that step in their level, they get closer to where everyone else is a lot quicker than when everyone's trying to learn the thing together. Yeah, there's no doubt. And that's like when you have those guys that know the system, like the back of their hand, uh, that permeates through the entire meeting room. Uh, when you break up an offense and defense, there, there there's absolutely no doubt. So that's some some really positive news. You know, some positive things we heard from the coaching staff about some of the players. Now, some not so positive news. The University of Oklahoma announced that tailgating will be prohibited on the OU campus, including parking areas, for the entire season. We knew this season was going to be weird, for lack of a better term. Uh, this takes away, in my opinion, one of the best things about going to a college football game. I mean, we're still waiting on the official capacity limit, but this sucks, man. I, I, I know that they don't have – they really don't have a choice there at the university. We talk about liability – all the time and it just it, it wouldn't have made much sense at all they also canceled homecoming so it just this sucks I, I don't know what else to say you know you and i we don't get to tailgate because we're working but at least not that anyone knows about yeah wink wink huh <laughs> um but th this just sucks I, I feel bad for the fans the season's already going to be weird enough with the capacity limit and then you tack on no tailgating and it's it's just depressing man it, it tailgating is an essential part of college football in my mind and i just i don't know what else to say it sucks yeah well you know for a big majority of college football fans um it's more like they go to tailgate and the game happens to take place also. You know, it's like the game is secondary. They go for the party and to hang out and to see all their friends and do all the stuff outside of the stadium. And, man, I know a ton of people. My wife is from Norman. She's got a ton of friends in Norman. And every weekend they all go to the stadium into Campus Corner, but none of them go to the game. None of them zero Which is, go to the game. That's so, normal too. Yeah, that's that's a perfect example of why I think they had to. Like they they didn't have another choice because, like you're saying, there's eighty five thousand people that go to the game, right? Probably three or four times that that are there. I mean, I don't know. I, it'd be hard to predict the amount of people that are just on campus drinking beer and eating food like it's mm -hmm. it's just fun that's what it is it's fun you get to hang out with your friends and have fun in a fun setting even if you're not going to the game so it uh damn it coronavirus well, is an asshole a pure asshole it's been horrible my my big question is i i wonder how this the, like this whole thing plays out you know, um, people are still going to park to go to the game. People are still going to drink outside of the game. Why? What is going to be? What's an official tailgate like? What's Campus Corner going to be like? Well, I mean, let's just say that um, a, a, a dad and his son go to the game and the son is 21 years old they go to the game and they park the pickup truck and they've got you know they've got beers and a, a little grill i mean it's two guys a, a tailgate party i mean i'm just saying like i wonder what the what the, the threshold the, the, the threshold tailgate is. threshold I, and dude, I, I have no idea and i saw one one school it all like comes together now i can't remember who it was but they said no more than 10 people at a gathering or, you know, so I'm like, well, I think that was Texas tech. I think tech. I think that was, you're right. Yeah. So I'm like, well, if you got four pickup trucks and four parking lots, so that's 40 people. 
that's a tailgate party. You know what I'm saying? It's like, is it 10 people per vehicle? Is it like, how does, I don't, I don't know. It just, I think it's one of those things where they're issuing guidelines and kind of hoping that people respect that and follow the rules, <laughs> but That's they're not going to go around with a taser and, you know, start arresting people and throwing them in the paddy wagon if they're standing around in a group drinking a beer. But maybe I'm wrong on that. I don't know. I just, I don't know how they're going to, I don't know how or if they're going to enforce that very uh, strictly. Yeah. Uh, it'll be, it'll be really interesting. Now, one last piece of local college football news is from the recruiting world, because obviously we're big recruiting guys now and Oklahoma made the final three for five-star running back Kamar Wheaton. Now Wheaton attended Caleb Williams's sooner summit. And you saw him in a couple pictures out there on social media and I know a lot of OU fans are excited about this guy I've watched a lot of highlight tapes of Kamar Wheaton and the first guy and I know it's ridiculous to compare guys that just got done playing high school football or still playing high school football to NFL stars but he's got a little Alvin Kamara in him just a little bit like smooth bounces off tackles like doesn't look like he's moving that fast but just eats up ground runs strong shifty elusive like just a a combination of everything you want in a running back and it's obvious that OU wants him badly so it, it was good to see him have OU in his top three now I guess it was supposed to be a top two from what I'm told is LSU was kind of a late addition. It was just supposed to be OU and Bama, but people seem to really like OU's chances with this kid. So we'll see, but dude, I don't know. I'm not a recruiting guy. He came to the summit. Give me your best guess. Yeah, he goes OU. Really? Why not? He'll get stuck on the depth chart at Bama. Well, whoever thinks. Just like Alvin Kamara did. (laughs) <laughs> Whoever thinks they're going to get stuck on the uh, depth chart, though, as a five-star running back. I mean, um, here's what I think has been really going against Oklahoma when it comes to running backs. And this changed a little bit last year. But we, we haven't had a featured back in a long time. It's always two or three guys getting a ton of rotation. Whenever you have two or three guys getting a ton of rotation – the numbers aren't great. Um, you know, you'll have guys that have a, a thousand yards, but that's kind of a, been about what the cap is low amount of touchdowns. And I think that's hurt them. Um, you know, they haven't had a whole lot of um, draft picks at running back. So I think that hurts them a little bit. Um, I think last year with Kennedy Brooks has a chance because that's the first time we've really seen a guy turn into a feature back. And, Obviously, they're not telling the Wheaton kid that, yeah, we think you can come here and split time with four other players. It'd be great. You know, <laughs> be an that's interesting not recruiting pitch. Yeah, that's not what they're telling him. But I do think that that's hurt them, even though I think they've got great talent in the running back room. I don't think they're hurting for talent at all right now. I, I will say going and playing for DeMarco Murray probably – Fully agree. Is, is a little different than what – OU's been able to do in the recruiting process the last couple of years. Like, it, if people don't think that DeMarco Murray being the running backs coach doesn't make a huge difference in recruiting, like, it's just, just ridiculous. Like, this guy was, I mean, offensive player of the year in the National Football League. So it's, um, I, I think that is, that is a powerful, powerful recruiting tool for Oklahoma. But, you know, and that's a heck of a point, and I agree a thousand percent. I'll just add this. You know, he's not just a pretty face and a former NFL football player. He is a good-looking dude. I got no problem. <laughs> it, we were teammates together. I got no problem. It That is one good-looking dude. Right. So, but he's also, according to everyone around the program, doing an 
unbelievable job as a football coach. If you didn't know that he was a, a former great and a former NFL guy that's made a ton of money and maybe a future owner of a, a major league baseball team in, in at some percentage, if you didn't know any of that, you'd just think, now that guy's one hell of a football coach, which, you know, is – you know, can be shocking. A lot of guys step in and feel like they're they're owed something, and because of their their stature and who they are and what they've accomplished, that they don't have to do all of these different things. And he hasn't done that at all. Um, and he's he's doing a great job with those guys. So I do agree that that does mean something, especially uh, I, for a, a Texas kid. I think you've heard the same things that I've heard. I heard he is chewing those kids' asses. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Love so it. old school baby all right instead of the national college football roundup we have an interview with ralph russo who is the head college football writer for the associated press with the preseason poll coming out and the all-american teams coming out we thought that ralph would be the perfect guy to break that all down and that interview is brought to you by insurica do you own a business if you do you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding a loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best-in-class, connect with Insurica at insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A.com. All right, here's Ralph Russo from the Associated Press. It is our pleasure to be joined by Ralph Russo. Ralph is the, the college football writer for the Associated Press. He is also the host of the AP Top 25 College Football Podcast, which I am a frequent listener of. You can catch Ralph on Twitter at, at Ralph D. Russo AP. Ralph, how you doing, man? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. That's a great introduction. I, I, you know what? I do Sirius XM and I can't even get my partners on there to mention my damn podcast. (laughs) (laughs) See, so I I appreciate the plug. (laughs) I, I always listen to the podcast, which is before we jump into the AP top 25 coming out, uh, I'm sure you haven't gotten any feedback on that with the way you guys did things, but (laughs) <laughs> One interesting thing, and you bring it up on the podcast all the time, you're married to an epidemiologist. Yeah, yeah. And between what has gone on with college football and what you do for a living and clearly what your wife is doing with the coronavirus going, I assume the Russo household has been rather hectic. Yeah. Um, listen, her job is far more important than mine. I always kid around like I, you know, like a lot of guys, we try to marry up. Um, you know, if I was just going to be a schlubby sports writer, like marry a doctor and an epidemiologist, like that's a good, <laughs> that's a good score Smart. for me. Um, but yeah, she, and she also, wor- like you know, for your listeners, like we live in New York City. She works for the New York City Department of Health. So she has been you know, I, will, I don't want to use the word frontline because that would imply that she's in hospitals working with patients. And that's not that. She's not a frontline worker. But she's been sort of in the, in, the, in the belly of the beast to a certain degree with like trying to figure out how to stop this thing and, and how to help people manage it and things along those lines. So it's been, uh, it's been interesting. Really since January, she has just been so, so busy. You know, the funny thing with me is we kind of thought like, oh, you know, by the end of the summer, things will be a little more normal. And like by college football time, we would get a relatively smooth launch. Like there would be some complications, but it wouldn't go completely haywire. But you're right. Like throughout the summer, her job has actually been getting a little easier because things are mellowed here in New York. 
where my job, you know, the world is on fire in college football <laughs> for the last couple of months. Um, the other thing to, you know, the, the, the one who's really getting the short end of this is my, my 14 year old daughter who doesn't get paid attention to at all. Like we don't even feed the poor kid. Like it's just, you know, it's like seven o'clock comes around and we're like, have you eaten yet? It's like, well, you didn't make dinner. I'm like, well, okay, I guess we're going to go get McDonald's again. You know, I bet, you know, whenever you, uh, started as a sports writer, Probably the last thing you ever thought would be the most common question you got was, well, what does your wife think? Yeah. The funny thing is, I, you know, it, it has, I do get so much of that. The, the people who know me and kind of know what Sally does for a long time, I get a lot of texts about like, what does she think about this? What does she think about that? And, you know, listen, I mean, she's very, very smart, but she's also sort of very concentrated in her world here. So she doesn't necessarily know, like, so what's the latest on the vaccine? Like, that's not her job. Like, so it's not that she doesn't know about, she she would be informed, but not much more than like somebody who's up on the news. So, but we do get a lot of like, what does Sally think about this? I can imagine, you know, that the, uh, the fate of college football is well down the New York Department of Health uh, list of uh, priorities. <laughs> Yeah, you know, though, it's interesting because I will listen, she's been a valuable resource, like explaining some things to me so I can make my way through this with my own reporting, because I can't tell you how many other epidemiologists and doctors and people I'm talking to, you're trying to report this intelligently, but I know college sports, I don't know anything about this stuff. So she can help me like explain, hey, I just got off the phone with a source and they said this and I'm looking at my notes, like what does this mean to you? Or does this check out? So she can definitely help me with some of that stuff. But mostly like she's just been so damn busy. She's like, leave me alone, like go, go away from here. Uh, the, I think the interesting thing with her is like sometimes I'll bounce things like, hey, do you think they should be playing college football? And, and, you know, she'll say like, well, listen, I don't really know exactly what they're doing on campuses. So I don't want to necessarily give an uninformed opinion. So if you if I had more data, maybe I could. But she'll also come away saying, you know, we're not doing a very good job with this pandemic. So maybe they shouldn't, you know, like maybe, maybe, maybe like we should think bigger picture here. But but anyway, it is interesting to have her to bounce some things off of. She doesn't have all the answers, but she definitely is helpful. Yeah, I can, I can only imagine, Ralph. <laughs> now, you guys, you, you kept doing your thing. It seems like since the beginning of time, right, that the preseason AP Top 25 has come out, and I was, I was so excited to see you guys release it. And then I saw it, and I saw Ohio State sitting there at number two, and I looked at it, and I was like, wait, did I – did I miss something? Did they announce that they're going to play again? So nine total teams from the Pac-12 and Big Ten that obviously won't be playing in the fall. What was the decision-making process? Uh, I know it wasn't your decision alone, I assume, but why did you guys decide uh, at the Associated Press to include those teams that have already canceled football in the fall? Yeah, I, I, I love the way you answer, asked the question because you, uh, you acknowledge the fact that it's not on me. Don't blame me if you How don't like it. How many people have just blamed you? <laughs> you well, I, you know, oddly, though, because of everything that's going on in the world, I, 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 we, haven't, we didn't get as much, like, interaction on the poll as we usually do. I think people are still having a hard time putting, sort of wrapping their arms around the fact that the season is going to start. In fact, I'd love to ask you guys about that, too. But essentially – so my bosses ultimately make the decision, but I certainly give input, right? They want to know my opinion. And my opinion was like, listen, first of all, we don't know if any of these teams are going to play. <laughs> like, secondly, we don't know if, don't if, they say start, that, Ralph. <laughs> if they do start playing, we don't really know if we're going to have a full season. But the other part of it was like the AP, the one thing we pride ourselves with the poll Listen, we understand that we're not as relevant as we used to be because we have a playoff that decides the national champion. But the, the AP poll is one of the few threads that runs through all of college football history, just like you said, right? So the AP poll sort of tells the story of college football. And as a storyteller, you know, journalist and a storyteller, like I kind of thought to myself, like, 
this poll should also reflect the story of the season. And the story of the season is going to be like what we lost, what we salvaged, um, and, and maybe what we gain, maybe somehow what we gain at the end. Like it's just the weirdness of the season I felt like should be sort of told in the poll. So you have a preseason poll that has all these teams because we did think they were going to play and then, and then nobody's played yet. So we're judging them all the same on like, you know, what they might be because that's what a preseason poll is. And then having them drop out. And that's the key. Like these teams will be gone when the season starts, when, when, when games start being played and the first regular season poll comes out on Sunday, September 13th, those teams are no longer eligible to be voted on. If you're not actually playing, you're no longer eligible to be voted on. So I thought that was a good way to sort of tell the story of the season, you know, 50 years from now, people are going to look and say, so all these teams were there and then they were gone. Like what happened? Oh, a pandemic happened. Well, that's weird. <laughs> um, so that, that, that was the basis. And my bosses sort of agreed to, for the most part with that. So we just, they decided to stamp, stamp approval on that. And that's how we're going to go through. But listen, again, if, if, if y'all don't think that's a great idea and you kind of looked at it and like, that's stupid. Like, I get it. I understand it's weird. So I'm not here to die on the hill. I'm just going to explain why we did it. I, I just saw it and I was like, okay, that's pretty cool. Like these teams get their recognition. And I like put myself in the shoes, you know, back when I was playing college football. And I just imagined that it would have made me so mad. Like the players and coaches in those locker rooms that aren't playing in the fall, like they would just be so, like I would have been so angry looking up if I was playing at Ohio State, for example, and been like, listen, we are at the number two preseason team in the country and we're not even get to going to get to play. Like that would be infuriating. And I'm sure it is for some of those guys. No doubt. Listen, I, well, I'll ask you guys, because you, you guys both played on some pretty awesome teams. Because, um, you, you know, your coaches always say, oh, we don't pay attention to those polls. We don't pay attention to that stuff. And the players then rip, parrot what their coaches say, right? Because they tell you, hey, if anybody asks about the polls, just tell them we don't care. We don't pay attention to that stuff. But when the poll did, yeah, but when the poll did come out, like you and your teammates, like at least for a couple of minutes went like, yeah, man. We're number one. I, I think Teddy, I think you may have both been on preseason number ones. Teddy, I'm pretty sure you were, right? Yeah, yeah. I yeah, was and, for sure. Yeah, and Gabe, you Gabe, were you were, what, I, you, yeah. you were, you were on preseason one, right? Or, I or at least so close to it, right? We were close to it, and it's then we were, you were. We were. Or 11. I can't remember if we were preseason one, but we definitely were ranked number one in the AP poll at yeah. certain times during the season. No doubt. And every time that happened, we lost the next game, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so that's – that's thanks, Ralph. Thanks for the reminder. I, no, I'll just my, tell you that yeah. I think that – I think it's – it's every team says that. Every coaching staff says that. You got to, you know, block all that stuff out. All we're worried about is rankings at the end of the season or, or however they phrase that. But – like, for me personally, I never looked at any poll. I never looked at any article. I never looked at any newspaper. I never listened to any radio show. And it's shocking that I do radio now. I had never listened to a sports talk radio show not one time in my whole entire life until I retired from the sport. Not You're one smart, time. Ted. You're smart, Teddy. It's, it's a hellscape. It's, well, <laughs> it, here's the thing. Here's what's strange. I, I never grew up as a sports fan. Mm -hmm. I, li I loved playing sports, but I never watched it. I never listened to it. I never read about it. So it was, it was something that I just, for whatever reason, wasn't interested in. And I'm like the, I'm like the robot drone on the team that just like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Whatever you say, do whatever I'm told to do. So I think it varies a little bit, but man, I'll tell you this. Nowadays compared to when I played, it's, I mean, it's impossible to not see stuff nowadays. I mean, no doubt. Yeah, it is no doubt. Everywhere. Social media era and things along those lines. I mean, you're a younger guy than I am, but yeah, it's completely different from when, when we even really gave. I mean, it was, it was, it's changed a lot even from when you played and you didn't play that long ago. Yeah. I mean, it's with, with Twitter and Instagram and all these things. I mean, these guys are constantly 
being exposed to this stuff, which uh, Ralph, that's why I want to, uh, I want to bring up you. The AP voted Oklahoma number five. Mm-hmm. Now, all logic says they'll bump up to number four with Ohio State falling out. But with all the question marks that Lincoln Riley's football team has, I mean, starting with the quarterback position, you know, replacing a guy like C.D. Lamb, some of the suspensions they have, some of the, and then the question mark of their defense basically in its entirety, right? Right, as always, right? Uh, what, what makes Oklahoma a top five football team? Is that just kind of the expectations and almost the level of excellence that's been established in Norman over the last couple of decades? I, I, I do think it's that. I think that when you become this dominant, this consistently dominant, I mean, you're talking five straight Big 12 five titles straight, now. Yeah. yeah, you know, now I will say this. Now, okay, just to be clear, I don't vote. Okay, just so your listeners know that. I think you guys might know that, but I don't vote. We pick the voters at the AP, which are, you know, media guys and gals, you know, sports writers, broadcasters uh, from all over the country, and we just count them up. So I don't vote. So what I often do is I didn't have quite, I wasn't, I didn't have quite the, uh, the passion to do it this year because, again, it's been such a weird year. Um, but I'll, I'll look at the poll and I'll pick, it, pick at it too, just like you guys might. Just got, you, you might open it up and say, ah, they're overranked that team and the voters were underranked that team. Uh, I'll do that too a little bit. And, and I got to tell you, I, like, I think Oklahoma may have been a couple of spots too high this year. I don't know if I would have put them ahead of LSU, um, only because of a lot of the question marks you're talking about. But again, it, it, it speaks to the respect Lincoln Riley has. You, you have to assume they're going to play good offense at Oklahoma. At this point, why not? I mean, you've had three different quarterbacks, three different Heisman winners. You see the way his offense runs. It, it hardly misses a beat. Like, you know, the production, the raw numbers end up looking the same from year to year. Maybe they get there a slightly different way, a little more passing with uh, Baker, a little more running with Kyler, then up the running and, and do some different things in the passing game with Jalen. So why shouldn't Spencer Rattler be s- successful in this? Why shouldn't they have another boatload of playmakers to be successful, Rambo and these other guys around him? So I think, it, you know, the, the offensive line, lots some changes there. But nonetheless, with like Ben Ba, you have one of the best offensive line coaches in the country. So why shouldn't that still be good? So, you know, again, my personal opinion, yeah, maybe a little high, as you said, with a lot of the, the question marks. But I also think, again, they've established such a high level of performance. You sort of know what you're going to get out of Lincoln Riley on the offensive side. And that's enough to, for, for, I think, a lot of people to say, yeah, you know, top five, top six, something along those lines. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things around here is there's a lot of, you know, we've got some pretty notable statisticians around here. One of the things is, um, you know, a modern era of fo- football, which is like, you know, post-World War II. I think there should be a new one uh, pre-Facebook and post-Facebook. That's like <laughs> the new – that's going to be the new era. But, you know, whenever it comes to Oklahoma, I was going to ask you to kind of take us in, inside the war room and, and, like, as you guys discuss the poll. And, obviously, like you said, you don't vote on it. So, just kind of from the same shape – getting an idea of outside kind of our our Big 12 bubble, the thoughts on Oklahoma and the Big 12, like, do you think that five straight Big 12s, it's impressive. It's incredibly impressive. But at some point, is there – does that become like a – Like a, a Clemson in the ACC thing it's like, well, type of situation. Of course they win it every year. The conference is terrible. And is that a negative mark? And the other thing is – because we hear this every year, the playoff and Oklahoma losing in the playoff several times. How much do you think that that has factored in or will factor in if those things continue? Yeah, that's interesting because I actually I think I had this conversation with somebody about Oklahoma. Somebody asked me, like, do you think Oklahoma will get the benefit, continue getting the benefit of the doubt, considering they haven't won a playoff game? So in other words, if there's a close vote in the next couple of years, and maybe, maybe this season, right, between like last year, we almost had it. It would have been a, an interesting vote between Utah and Oklahoma. It didn't pan out. Oklahoma gets in. 
um, a couple of years ago was Oklahoma or Ohio State, and Oklahoma got in. So it's not supposed to be a factor, but you know. So we're, you mentioned the uh, the um, the AP poll. You know, we don't necessarily influence the playoff, but it's still, you know, I think, again, like you do have, right, it's, it's still a national perception. So if you're talking about the national perception of Oklahoma, very high, they're, they're expected to be champions. They're, they seem to be, I think the, the national perception is they are right slightly below what we consider the very elite, right? We, we look at Alabama and Clemson, and they are sort of in a tier to themselves. And LSU was able to jump into that tier for a year. We see Georgia and think that may, they're, they're kind of near that tier, though they haven't sort of broken through. And I think you can make an argument that, out, that Ohio State is, is in that tier. And you feel like, well, Oklahoma is there too, because the numbers suggest Oklahoma is there. Uh, and I think that's why they end up being number five, right? But, but, but speaking to a broader point to what you're talking about, I do wonder if the playoff failures in some way make us think of Oklahoma as not really in that tier, but in the very next one all by themselves. So there's this tier of teams that are recruiting at a super high level that we think of can win a national championship. And it's, and it's the teams that have won a national championship during the playoff era. Alabama, Clemson, Ohio State won one. Uh, they've been in the playoff a lot now, LSU, maybe Georgia. But, for, but I think because of the playoff failures, Oklahoma is next rung. Maybe, and it might be a rung all by itself. It really is because a lot of times you, you right. look at it and you may say, as a national uh, fan, look at it and say, oh, why Oklahoma again, really? Let's give someone else a chance. And then it's like, okay, who? Absolutely. Utah? Yeah. I mean, you're really going to tell me you'd rather see Utah playing LSU or Alabama than Oklahoma? And everyone's like, oh, well, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> Listen, I mean, if, if Oklahoma had been able to fix it, look, uh, what happened last year with LSU, I don't like to bang on Oklahoma too much because LSU was ridiculous. I mean, they kind of did it to Clemson too. So, yeah. you know, Clemson put up a little more of a fight, but you know, Oklahoma, LSU was a wagon last year and they were rolling over anything, right? Oklahoma, you know, they nearly beat Georgia a couple of years ago. So clearly there, again, there's something missing from Oklahoma to keep them out of that, that very elite tier. But, and really, what is it missing? It's, it's pretty obvious. You just sort of open up the recruiting rankings and you realize, oh, those teams are, you know, have X many five and four stars and Oklahoma is a little lower than that. And a lot of the, and they're not doing it on the defensive side of the ball. So it's a fairly simple equation here of why they're just outside of that. Um, but, you know, again, when you're playing offense at that level, it always sort of gives you this chance where you can sort of dream that like, wow, if we just play a little better defense, which is essentially what happened in the Rose Bowl, right? That team was very capable of beating Georgia. Just came up a couple of plays short. But I think that's where, you know, where Oklahoma is. It's almost in the tier all by itself. Now, Ralph, Oklahoma State getting some respect in this poll coming in at number 15, right behind Texas and number 14. Now, when a couple of these teams drop out, Oklahoma State's going to be right on the edge of the top 10 in the country. I think there's some high expectations for Mike Gundy uh, with Chuba Hubbard and Tylen Wallace coming back with them expecting some big things from Spencer Sanders. Once again, a lot of question marks on that defense. I know they have a lot of guys back, but do you think this is one of those weird years in college football where Oklahoma State could be a team that makes some noise, or, or do you just think that they don't have maybe quite enough talent up and down that roster? The question I've asked with the Big 12 in general over the last few years, not to turn a, an Oklahoma State question into an Oklahoma question, because, but it, it's all about sort of Oklahoma. It's all what you are relative to Oklahoma in the Big 12. So this year, my question would be is, this, this seems to be the year that you're going to close the gap on Oklahoma. That the rest of the Big 12 has the opportunity for all, again, for all the reasons that you mentioned, new quarterback, um, some, some suspensions, 
you know, Kennedy Brooks, is, I don't, Kennedy Brooks did opt out, right? That is that, did that actually happen or it, are we still unclear on funny, that? It, funny question. It happened, but he hasn't announced anything. So but we, we talked about that on our last episode, Ralph. We were like, this is kind of weird. What's going on? Yeah. That, yeah. So we, we can get into we can there. get we can get when, when we talk about the weirdness of this season we can get into some of that too because I think I think some of the weirdness is is a, is Oklahoma has voiced some of the weirdness and I think Lincoln Riley has done a good job of that but I guess again getting back to your other point I think it's all about in the Big Twelve is what is the gap between the from the rest of the Big Twelve and Oklahoma to me it would seem like this is the type of year that if you got a shot this is it. And if you're and if you're an Oklahoma State team that has your All American running back, your All American wide receiver, your you know, fl- your your you know mer- emerging talented quarterback, um, a pretty good offensive line, all these defensive starters back. You're right. I mean, you've had some issues defensively, but you've got a lot of ex- experience there. I'm not going to even try to pronounce the kid's name, the linebacker. Amen. But. Um, but you know you've got talent there. There are legitimate players on the, even on the defensive side of the ball. You find yourself thinking like, yes, if it's going to happen, if the streak is going to end, this seems to be the opportunity to make that streak end. So is it Oklahoma? Is it Texas? Is it an Iowa State? It just seems like the margin is going to be small. The margin in the Big 12 always seems to be, even even in the last couple of years, is as good as Oklahoma has been. The margin was relatively small last year. It was it wasn't as big as let's say Clemson in the ACC, where Clemson is just so far out ahead of everybody else in the ACC. There's enough competition in the Big 12 to make Oklahoma work. They've had they won the close games in the last couple of years. Is this the year where? Hey, that close game against Texas where we make a big comeback, maybe we don't do it this year. Yeah. You want to see a, a state meltdown. Um, Oklahoma State wins the Big 12. And since this is a, a smaller pool this year, I think whoever wins the Big 12, no oh, yeah. matter what, is going to be in the playoff. In. And yeah. on a typical year, there's probably a good chance that Oklahoma State would be looked over for a, for a, a Big 10 or maybe an Oregon or someone like that. But you know, if they win the Big 12 this year, which isn't out of the realm of possibility, they're in. You want to see a state meltdown? Oklahoma State goes to the playoff and wins a football game. <laughs> this, oh, my that gosh. would be a total, total disaster. But, um, you know, Phil Steele came out, and after the Big 10 and Pac-12 uh, canceled their season, he picked Central Florida to make the playoff to be one of the four teams in the playoff. Now, UCF and Cincinnati are 20 and 21 in the AP poll. You eliminate those teams in front of them. All of a sudden, you're going to have two non-Power 5 teams that are going to be fringe top 10 type of teams to start the season off. And one of the problems with them is they've always started too far back and as the season went on, couldn't make up enough ground. Now, I know they're not going to have those premier – uh, non-conference games like they've had in the past where that's their real big chance to get in. But because of the situation, is this the best chance maybe that we've seen for a non-Power 5 uh, squad to make it to the playoff? I think so. And because of what you just said, right, you, you, you just by simple elimination, those teams are going to be, I, I, you know, I don't, the AP poll generally treats those teams better than the playoff committee. A lot of times the group of five teams do generally better with the AP poll. Uh, If you ask me for an explanation, I think AP voters look at it more as a reward, the ranking, where I think the, the, the committee might look at it more as could A beat C, could, could, or could X beat Y. So I think that's part of the reason why, but yeah, no, I, I think you're right. I think it's a better year, better chance for those teams than ever before. I think UCF actually might be pretty loaded this year, frankly. I, I know they're they are both Cincinnati's there. good too. That's a, actually a really good conference, man. It has been for years. A so, lot of good so, coaches too. So here, here's my question with the, the thing that's going to be really difficult with for the playoff to deal with. Because these teams are playing, the, the Power 5 teams especially, are playing mostly nothing but other Power 5 teams. And 
for the SEC and the, and the ACC, that means even more conference games. In the Big 12, you're still doing the nine that you normally do. I wonder if the other thing that helps those non-Power 5 teams is the cannibal, cannibalization in the SEC or in the ACC, or, you know, maybe even the big, the big 12 sort of does this a lot anyway. The, again, we were talking about the big 12, the thing that the big 12 does better than any of the other conferences is it has a great middle. The big 12's middle is very capable of beating the big 12's top. I always like, I, I, feel, I always feel like the big 12 has more balance than any of its um, that, that any of the other power fives. From, you can go pretty much almost down to like eight um, within the Big 12 and find yourself with competitive games. Like eight and two can be a competitive game in the Big 12. Five and one can be a really competitive game. Now, Kansas sort of blows that out of the water, but that's <laughs> – Poor Kansas. Well, uh, unfortunately, I agree with you, but, you know, because of the Big 12's history and the fact that Oklahoma – hasn't been able to get it done on the big stage. I mean, I think that something that you're pointing out, which typically would work in their favor, I think almost works against them. Well, the, the only thing is that you, you only got the three, power, the three power fives in four spots. And I really do think that the committee will probably default to, as you said, whichever one of three of those teams, win a, whichever uh, teams come out of those two confer- those three conferences, we should have a spot for them. It's that other fourth spot where you, instead of assuming, oh, it's just going to be another SEC team. It's just going to be whoever's second in the ACC or whoever's second in the Big 12. To me, I find myself thinking you have those extra games in those other two Power Five conferences to provide more losses. Like, it's one thing if Georgia's 10-1 and and Alabama's 11-0. and Okay, sure. But if those other conferences are sitting there with the number two teams in those conferences with two, three losses, which is certainly possible. Cause again, you have all these conference games, you could end up second place team that's sitting there seven and three, right? To me, that opens up the possibility that if you come out strong in the American, why not? Like, why not? How are they playoff committee going to justify like, okay, seven and three or uh or, or, or eight and three Georgia is in over a 10 and 0 or 11 and 0, what, however many games they're playing UCF. I just think it would be a really bad look. Which also is something because of the strange year. I mean, UCF or, or if it's Cincinnati, whichever one mm-hmm. could end up with like a top 10 win and a top 15 win beating, point two. you know, uh, if, if it's, UCF beating Cincinnati and Memphis. So, and typically they would have no chance to do that, but that's going to be on the resume. That's a good point too. That the, the AAC being a good conference will probably have a fair amount of representation in the top 25. Because again, like, I mean, how many five and five SEC teams can you put in there, right? Like, I mean, at a certain point, you got to say, like, you got to hold those teams accountable for wins and losses. So I I think you made a great point with that. They will actually have some wins that could impress the playoff committee. Now, Ralph, uh, did want to get to the AP preseason All-American teams that got released, uh, had some local guys here in the state of Oklahoma and Creed Humphrey and Chuba Hubbard on the first team, Tylen Wallace, Gabe Burkich on the second team. But a- as I looked at it, I-, I didn't have the same reaction as I did when I looked at the preseason poll. It- this one more made me, I don't know if sad yeah. is the right word. But I'm glad you, I'm glad you said that. I think that's what we were going for. I okay. Really okay. We we, for. Well, it worked, man. It definitely worked. <laughs> Because you look at the first team, 11 players on the first team, preseason All-American team, won't be playing in the fall. 12 players on the second team, preseason All-American team, won't be playing in the fall. And it, it was just like a – it was a reminder that, yes, this season is weird, but also we're not going to get to see a lot of the best players in college football play college football – and that sucks, Ralph. It does. And so a little perspective here, like, you know, I grew up in New York City. 
I don't have a, a connection to a conference or a team like a lot of people. I love the sport for the entirety of the sport. You know, like I understand how you all get into your arguments about how good the Big 12 is and the SEC and this and that. And that's fine. I, I love that too. It's cool. But that's just not, that's just not my thing. I love you all for what you're worth. Like I just love the, I love all my children the same. <laughs> and I just love the entirety of college football. So you're right. Like not no, like knowing that like, oh man, like we're not going to watch Micah Parsons last season at Penn State that guy was a freaking beast. Like he was so much fun to watch play football and we will not get to see that this year. So when you start running through all these guys and like, like, you know, Penny Sewell is like one of the best offensive tackles we've seen in years. Right. And, you know, maybe they'll play in the spring. Hopefully we'll get a little something out of the PAC 12 and the big 10, but maybe not. And maybe we missed like this generational offensive lineman. So I think you're right, Gabe. Like, I mean, part of the thing that has made me just sad about this whole thing is I love all of college football. So if we're not getting all of it, I understand we'll have some of it and that's not to denigrate the parts of it that we get. There'll be good parts of it, but it's not the same. I want to watch teams from different conferences play each other. I want to watch these great players play when we have them for a chance, you know, the, the small window that we get of three years to watch these guys play. I want to see it. And I think it, the, the other part that makes you sad is, you know, I'm 50 now, so I'm an old guy. I relate to the players differently now. Like I look at them as kids because I'm so old and I sort of appreciate like what they get from this. So I kind of feel bad for them in the way I would feel bad for my daughter if she missed out on something, right? Like it means a lot for these players to play. So I can sympathize with them and sort of feel bad because they're, they're kids wanting to play. Like I look at them as they're 18 and 19 year old kids who don't get a chance to do this great thing that they that we love watching them do. So I feel bad for them as, as well. And again, I'm not trying to sound like too much of an old man here, but and a sap, but it does. Like it, it, the, the reaction that you get, you got, like when you start looking at what's gone from the season, that's kind of what we were going for. We wanted to show people like, hey, this great season that you thought we were going to have, not going to be quite as good. And you make the most of it, but it's not going to be quite as good. Well, you mentioned you love the entirety of college football. And I love the way you put that because I, I was I was wanting to ask you, like, what your schedule is going to be. I mean, I'm sure typically <laughs> in a regular year, you're kind of all over the country seeing different teams and, and seeing different conferences. And, and it just kind of brings me to the, the question about, you know, college football and it's going to survive this there's no doubt but no doubt. what is great about college football if you talk to most people is the pageantry is the term that everyone uses you go to a you go to a small campus in the middle of uh, what a lot of times is nowhere and a hundred thousand people show up uh, they grill burgers and, and hot dogs behind their, their trucks. They watch other games. They play cornhole. It's, like, it's an experience. The band marches through, through uh, the middle of campus. You know, you've got the fall. You see the, the fall foliage. It's just – it's all of those things. You can smell – Damn it, Teddy, you are making football. me sad, bro. I know. Stop. It's like I just want it. No, I want to God. <laughs> But it's great. I, no, your description is my, perfect. My question, though, is, like I said, it's going to survive it, but what is this experience going to be like? You know, without, you know, some, some places no fans, some places 20%, and there's no tailgating. There's, it's just going to be a totally different sport. And, you know, NBA, NFL, those sports, I think, people watch to watch the game and they do in college as well, but college is more about the experience. And I wonder what's this sport going to be like without the experience? Yeah. Um, 
Daddy, honestly, you couldn't have said it better. And, and I, my, my answer to you is I don't know, but I am interested to find out. And I am totally with you. Like, this is, you know, the reason why I got into college football as a kid in Queens, you know, who has no relationship to any of these teams and I didn't go to any of these schools was because you would watch on a Saturday and again, I'm going to make my make myself sound really old when there was like one game on TV and it was always and the game I would always re really be excited for was Oklahoma, Nebraska, because I was in the 80s and that was the biggest game of the year. And like from a kid from Queens, like Norman, Oklahoma might as well have been Mars. Like, <laughs> where is that? Like Norman, Oklahoma. And these guys have these half jerseys and they're like playing this weird And Lincoln, Nebraska is no different, right? Oh, no I mean, doubt. By the way, yeah, that's not to let Lincoln off the hook there. But, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it, and it was. It was the pageantry and the cheerleaders and the bands and just the spectacle of it all. And that it was coming from these places, as you said, that were sort of in the middle of nowhere. And it made me want to find those places. I want to go to Baton Rouge. I don't know where that is, but I want to be there. I want to see Lincoln and Norman and these other small, Gainesville and Tallahassee. And I don't, like, you're right. I, I mean, listen, the games are the games and there's still going to be TV events and we will be interested in them. But it, it, there is definitely something that will be lost from this season that I, I think from a fan level, from a reporter's level, from the broadcasters and people who just love the game, it will, it will definitely feel different. And I wonder if it will feel different to the extent where even if we get through the fall and they hand somebody a championship trophy, we will sort of go, okay, we made it. Yeah, like it's just like now can we just get back to normal next year yeah almost like and that's not fair to the kids of relief. who win yeah. yeah yeah i well i've been talking to a lot of people trust me i think if you talk to administrators and people coaches and things like that you get a lot of that man i just hope we get through it like oh boy like this is going to be super exciting <laughs> like like really i'm no, just hoping to get through it can't wait for next off season <laughs> yeah now ralph you did mention that things are getting a little weird. I mean, we see the reports about LSU's offensive line, right? All but four of them tested positive or quarantining uh, the same day NC State and Virginia Tech uh, get postponed for two yeah. weeks because of an outbreak on NC State's campus and in their locker room. And on the same day, you've got ESPN dropping dates, times, yeah. broadcasting right. crews. Like, this is all in the same day. Like, how weird are we going to get, man? Because I thought today was one of those days that just described how odd this year is perfectly. Like, there was all this excitement, and then there was this news where you were like, wait a second, that's not good. Yeah. I, I mean, listen, I don't want to get too somber here because we understand like there is a worst case scenario here that we really don't even want to delve into. But for the most part, these kids will, when they get it, they will brush off the virus and they will be fine. Okay. So let's just talk about the more realistic scenarios of the, when I say the black cloud sort of hanging over the season, it is like, are, are we going to be able to play this game? Like it, it, it really like from week to week, we're going to sort of be like, OK, who's who's got enough bodies? Who's good to go? And again, like this sort of waiting for the bad news to constantly be waiting, constantly be waiting for the bad news to drop. And you're going to get to it through, through a week and you're going to be like, oh, everybody played. Way, hooray. Everybody played. That's awesome. And, and then the next week. No, uh, sorry, this X team, you're off the board. You're off the board. And, and I think the problem is, so I think we're going to play. I think we're going to start the season. I talked to an AD today, and I, I think he voiced something that, uh, well, Jack Swarbrick from Notre Dame, the AD there, said it on the record. And I think I'm hearing more of this from other ADs. And that is, I don't know if I can give my kids a good reason why we can't play. They've done the right things. Our program is in good shape. Our players are healthy. You know, we are, we are progressing in a way that I don't think I could reasonably tell them, hey, we can't play. So we're going to try to do this. But my question becomes, when you, again, when the ACC has to 
postpone a game three weeks before it even happens. I mean, they haven't even started playing them and we're already postponing. It, it, it sort of gives you a glimpse of how fragile this will be because if that happens during the season, is it just one game or is it, oh, well, we got to put you guys into quarantine for two weeks. So now it's I different have than basketball or baseball. You can't say, well, Hey, what does your guys next Tuesday look like? Let's play it then. You know, it's, it's, you, the, it's other thing, the other, the other thing, Teddy too. And like both of you guys, you guys played at a really high level. If I told you, okay, listen, Teddy, man, like I know you haven't tested positive, but you can't, you got to quarantine for two weeks. And, and you got to, like, quarantine. You're not allowed to go lifting. You're not allowed to work out with your team. You know, we can maybe set you up with some bands or something in your apartment. But you really can't be involved for two weeks. Now I'm going to take – And I feel take... fine. Like, I, I, feel, right. I feel fantastic. Yeah. But, but, the, but the point of that is, now I'm going to tell you, okay, after two weeks, now you got to go play Texas. After two weeks of sitting in your apartment. Mm-hmm. that's the other thing I think people are sort of missing here with some of this like oh well they'll be fine they'll be fine well first of all maybe they'll be mostly fine but there's also been some cases where you had these athletes they get like a relatively mild case of it but it sort of lingers and they're not totally right for two or three weeks so what happens to those kids where they get out of quarantine but you know like again they haven't touched the weight they haven't been to practice like what is that team what are those players look like after quarantine for two weeks and then say, oh, go play Baylor. Like now you have five days to prepare for Baylor after you've been sitting on your ass for 14 days. Mm -hmm. So I think those are some of the issues that are going to come about throughout this season. And it's going to make it very fragile. It's not just, oh, they can't play a game. So we'll reschedule it. It's, oh man, like we don't have enough to play this week. And I don't know if we're going to have enough to play next week. And then when we get all those guys back, they've been sitting on their asses for two weeks. So are they going to be ready to play the next week? And it's football. So this is healthy. Like it's a tough game regardless. So if you have most of your offense, if Lincoln Riley loses most of his offensive line, but still has offensive linemen, how thrilled do you think he's going to be Hey, Lincoln, you got to go play Texas with your entire second string offensive line. No, you can't forfeit. You can't back out. We can't postpone because, hey, it's only four players, but they just happen to all be your best offense or five players. They happen to all be your best offensive linemen. What does that look like in a season? What does it look what, like? So, so there, to a certain degree, it's not just like we're going to try to have this season. And I feel like Lincoln has. He, he's referenced this even if between the lines, my sense of listening to Lincoln is that he is sort of saying like, what the hell are we doing here? What what the hell are we doing here? Like, are we really going to try to do this? And I'm sure he wants to play and I'm sure Oklahoma's players want to play, but you just get that sense of listening to him. Like he more than any other coach I've heard has sort of given a li- at least a little bit of a voice to folks this is going to be really hard. That's all. There's the whole conspiracy theory to that thing that you just touched on. So, which is, which is, well, the conspiracy theory is that Lincoln Riley and Oklahoma don't want to play. Oh, in the because fall. of suspensions and because well, of the well, injuries. Or... They want to play in the spring because in the spring, all of the other top teams will be losing a bunch of really good (laughs) players to the NFL way more than Oklahoma would be. This is how we win the college football playoff. That's that's the conspiracy theory. Is that the conspiracy theory? Listen, though, listen, everybody's got their motivations that are, that are selfish, right? I, I agree with that. Listen, I think every coach in the country will be motivated by selfish reasons. And that's not that they think that they're bad guys. So maybe there is a little bit of Lincoln looking at his roster going like, you know, if we just put this off a little bit, I think we'd be in better shape. But I, I do respect Lincoln because I feel like, again, beyond, beyond a lot of coaches, I feel like he has been somewhat uh, refreshingly transparent. As transparent as these coaches get, 
in, in, in sort of voicing the idea that this is going to be really tough and we have to understand that this is going to be complicated. This is not about just toughing it through, guys. Like the rules that, that, are, that are applied to all this quarantining and testing stuff make this really difficult to put, uh, to, to put together. The other thing it does is puts a lot of pressure on the players. Like the players are doing a lot of work to do this. So when, when their first game gets canceled and maybe another game gets canceled or put, postponed, you, you also wonder like how much the players – with all this pressure to, to do this and all the work that they're putting in. And now, bam, hey, you can't play this week. They go, man, what are we doing here? Like, what is going on with this season? So I, I think that's, that's another reason why I think it becomes fragile because I think everybody involved is under a lot of pressure to make this work and it is doing a lot to make this work. And if it doesn't work, I think you will have the, the potential of a lot of people being really deflated really quickly. Is there, if that's not enough, would you mind if I threw another layer to it? Because the pandemic is, go for it, uh, is, has been incredibly difficult. But now all of a sudden we got talk about maybe the NBA walking out of the bubble. Um, you know, there's talk between some of the NFL guys about, uh, whether or not they should play because of some uh, social issues going on. Do you see a chance that this bleeds into college football? I mean, the, 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 I think the college kids take their cues from the pros. I think when they, I think you didn't see opt outs in college until they started in the pros for this season. Now they may have happened anyway, but as soon as the pros started having their opt out period, right after that, you had a couple of kids opt out even before their seasons were canceled in the Big Ten. So I think they take their cues from the pros. Um, it's hard. It's a hard thing to predict. So I don't know if I would predict it, but I would just leave it sort of at that. Like, I think that there's enough, enough of these kids understand, you know, again, I call them kids. They're young men. Enough of these young men understand that, hey, we are a very like they, they're, they're starting to understand their value, maybe even more than you did, Teddy, and more than you did, Gabe, especially in this pandemic, because they understand, my God, there's this monster, and we are the fuel that, that fuels this monster, this monster of college football. And if, we aren't, and if we aren't playing, the whole thing collapses. And they're asking us to play at a time when it's really hard. We want to play. We really, really want to play. But man, I got to get my, this thing stuck up my nose three times a day and I'm being social distance and I'm getting this and I have this protocol and that protocol. Like I definitely want to play and I'm down with playing, but man, you're asking me to do a hell of a lot to play. So if you don't listen to me, if you don't hear me out, then we're not doing this, right? And I think they really learned that over the last few months that like, listen, if you're gonna ask all of this for me, you gotta listen to me. Kids like to play. I don't think they have quite as much they, they, they realize how much power they have. I don't think they're quite as emboldened as the pros. So I don't know if they'd be quite as emboldened to maybe do some type of walkout, but I'm just saying, if you have a team or, you know, where maybe there's a little discontent, I think, again, going back to this is a very fragile year. I think things could be very fragile. I think things could get the things that a, a few years ago might have gotten settled on a Thursday in the locker room uh, or in the coach's office or in the meeting room. I think those things may have a chance of not getting settled and they get settled on a Saturday when all of a sudden we find out, uh, no, we're not playing, coach. You go go out there without us. See how right. that works. I wouldn't be surprised. I think it's, I think the climate is ripe for that. Yep. He is Ralph Russo. You can catch all his work for the Associated Press. Go follow him on Twitter at Ralph D. Russo AP. Make sure you go listen to the AP Top 25 College Football Podcast. Ralph, uh, I think I speak for Teddy and us, or Teddy and I both. This was fucking awesome, man. I mean, <laughs> Absolutely. The, that was that was incredible, dude. 
I was worried about saying ass. I would have oh, no, 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 no. we, uh, went nuts, man. We, you, we, we cuss. We cuss on this podcast, but man, uh, I, just I for Queens, like they don't cuss in Queens. <laughs> they don't do cuss. People from New York Jeez. City don't cuss. Let um, me bring my fourteen-year-old in here and tell you how many times <laughs> I've dropped an f bomb in front of her. Oh man! Um, one last question: What's your wife think? <laughs> <laughs> She thinks I shouldn't go on the road that much. She thinks I better be careful if I go cover a football game. That's does what she, she told think me. Oklahoma will win the Big 12 six straight times? Of course <laughs> she does. She's a doctor. She's smart. She, she's a Michigan State basketball fan. She doesn't really care that much about football. She's more hey. big Michigan State basketball. Hey, guys, let me also say this on, while we're still recording. You guys are fantastic at this. Like, you guys are really, really good at this at this whole medium, at this whole broadcasting thing. I mean, I, I've heard you both, but you guys are really good at this, and this was a lot of fun. I didn't think I was going to be on with you this long, but I'm so glad I was. Neither did because, we. <laughs> because because you just it was it was really easy to talk to, and you guys do a tremendous job. So thank you so much, and and I will probably force you to come on my podcast at some point, one one time or another. Awesome. Right? Just tell us when, Appreciate buddy. It, man. We're all about it. Thanks, Ralph. Appreciate the time, man. Thank you, guys. Thanks to Ralph Russo. Boy, Teddy, that that man can go. That man knows some football, doesn't he? No, that was fun, man. That was, you know, we kind of get stuck in Big 12 territory a little bit. Oklahoma What's, it? Territory. What's the term? My, myopic? Am yes. I remembering that correctly? I myopic? I'm going to take that as the, I, yes, I'm, I'm going with yes <laughs> okay, on that. Okay, perfect. But to be able to get a, an outside view of college football a little different spin on it is is fantastic and you know he's, he's got a great background a, a a good point of view and a lot of stuff he said in there is fantastic no i i agree 100 percent. that was great yeah i mean that was that was fantastic you guys go go check out all of ralph's stuff all right ted let's get to our segments and since it is thursday you know, we got to wet the beak just a little bit, talk some sports gambling, and wet the beak is brought to you by Tim Hughes Custom Homes. Are you looking to build your dream home? If so, Tim Hughes is the man you're looking for. Tim Hughes Custom Homes is a one-stop shop for all of your home building needs. He can find you a lot. He can find you an architect. He'll find you financing, and of course, he can build your dream home exactly the way you want it. Sounds too good to be true, right? Well, Tim found my wife and me a lot. He found us an architect and built our new house, and it is pretty sweet. Just ask Teddy. Now, Teddy's coming over soon. We don't know when. We got to iron out some, uh, some details, some details about the OU stuff, but we'll, we'll, we'll make it work. Now, he also builds office buildings. So if your business is looking to build a custom office, Tim Hughes is your man. You can see Tim's custom builds throughout Gallardia, Nichols Hills, Oak Tree, Stone Mill, and Rose Creek. It is a great time to build a house of your dreams. For more information to see Tim's spectacular work, visit his Instagram page at Tim Hughes Custom Homes or visit Tim Hughes Custom Homes.com. All right, Ted. Now we were going to wet the beak with the game six line for the Rockets and Thunder. I mean, that is, that's what the plan was. Well, game five did not happen. And so we can't fill time right here with a recap of game five. And we can't break down the line for game six because dude is kind of up in the air. And uh, I know that, it's controversial, right? You got a lot of people saying these guys shouldn't play, use your platform, stand up, you know, cause change. You've got a lot of people saying, I mean, really, what good does this do? Like, what, what do you think this will do? The NBA, they don't control public policy. They don't elect, you know, district attorneys and sheriffs and police chiefs. And that, and that's all true, but it's, it's this big moment in the history of sports. Like I, I can't think of a time where I, I saw a team say, Nope, not playing like the bucks did on Wednesday. And obviously the thunder and rockets followed that lead. I, I, I just, what, what was your reaction when it happened? Because I, I wasn't surprised. I did morning radio for Sirius XM on Wednesday and I threw it out there. I said, 
people, you need to prepare that some of these NBA games aren't about to be played because we, we all saw the outrage on social media uh, with what happened in Wisconsin. And you can think about how – you can think whatever you want about it. I'm, I'm not here to get into the politics of that. I think that, that that's just toxic, and I'm tired of dealing with the Twitter mentions and all that shit, and it just, it, it, it just wears on me. It really does. But I, I just – it was crazy. It was crazy to see it actually happen. That, that was my reaction. I was like, I understand what these guys are doing, but whole, uh, oh, my gosh, they did it. Well. Yeah, um, whenever I heard that it happened, Toby texted me. I was on air, and uh, obviously that became the huge, huge story in sports. So uh, we had heard quite a bit of chatter about this. Now, it was more about the Celtics' upcoming series. And – You know, there's been several guys on, you know, scattered teams throughout the NBA that have said, I don't even know why we're here. I don't even know why we're playing. We shouldn't be playing right now. And I'm not talking about because of the pandemic. So it wasn't, I guess, that shocking that it had actually happened. But um, the, the fact that someone tipped over the first domino is like, well, what happens from here? Because, you know, I, I do think that there's, there's a couple of factors involved here. You know, obviously the situation going on in Wisconsin is that's not what started. That's kind of, you know, whenever it comes to this, the straw that broke the camel's back. Okay. Um, so you have all that going on. You have the pandemic going on. You've also got a group of guys that uh, have been stuck in a hotel room for a month, you know, and haven't been able to see family and friends and loved ones. Um, you know, we've heard several, you, you heard Paul George, you know, talk pretty it, candidly about how mentally he's not been doing well in the and, bubble. So, And I want to, I want to make something clear. I, I saw people kind of poking fun at Paul George for that. And don't do that. Uh, listen, we people constantly, I mean, I don't want to use the word bag, but they yearn for athletes to be open and honest and to tell the media and the fans what they're thinking, what's going through their head, how they're feeling. You know, how do they feel about the game? And you're going to make fun of a guy for saying that he was in a dark place and he was experiencing some depression? Like, who are you? Like, what kind of person makes fun? You can make fun of him for not playing well, okay? But – when he starts talking about depression and being in a dark place, like that's not something to make fun of a professional athlete for Like that, that's one thing that bothers me about this entire thing. And I, and I got a lot of, a lot of mentions on Twitter about this, that uh, people think these guys should just get out there, play basketball, collect their check, entertain us. Got a couple of those. Like these guys are entertainers. I, I don't understand how a lot of people don't realize that, yes, these guys are out there playing sports for a living. Yes, they make a ton of money. Yes, they are out there playing a game for a living. But they have real-life problems, man. They're, they're, they're still human beings. They're, they're more than just these things that are supposed to bring us entertainment. Like, I, I, I'm i tired of people dehumanizing professional athletes. Like, these guys have shit going on in their lives. And it, it made me, uh, for especially for a guy like me, who, when I was on the fringe of the roster, I am not, and I have talked about it a number of times, I experienced a ton of anxiety, I was stressed. I was not in a good place mentally. 
for a long time playing football. It's one of the reasons I walked away. It is. And for these people to poke fun at him for being open and honest about what he's been struggling with, that, that, was, that was horrible. It was horrible to see people treat him that way. And I make fun of Paul George for playing bad in the playoffs <laughs> more than anyone. But when people started going there, man, it bothered me. It bothered well, me. It really did. Yeah, and I just think that – and he's not the only one. You know, if he's he's one of the guys that we've heard talk about it, and there's been a, a couple of other guys talk about it, and um, you know the stigma, and people have seen how uh, the reaction to Paul George was whenever he did speak about it and who, how other guys have spoke about it. It's not the tough guy thing to do. So – I know that there's a bunch of guys kind of going through the same thing. And whenever you add the fact that they've been in that bubble, you've got a pandemic going on. They can't see anyone. You've got social issues uh, out there as well. It's just, it's an environment that it's not shocking that, you know, some guys have said, I'm out. Let's, I don't know why we're doing this. Let's go. Let's leave the bubble. So it wouldn't shock me if, if people fall through with that. Now, I will say this. If, you know, I, I, I think that that would, be, that would be painful for Nate Silver and countless other people that have bent over backwards to get this thing going, to get this thing played. It wouldn't like if if the NBA said we're not finishing, I the world would keep spinning and people would be fine, and you know it would be dang it. Well, there's always next season, okay? And yeah, there'd be tons of money lost in 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 there and people, but they put this together so those guys could come out, earn the rest of their checks or some portion therein, play for a championship, compete for a championship went through painstaking effort to get this thing done. It it would be, it would be frustrating. I know if those guys, um, if they walked out after all of that work has been put in, and that doesn't make it right or wrong and, or anything, but I know right. that would be really painful because here's the thing. This is not a money making effort by the NBA. This thing is not making money. The ratings are not good. They had to pay. I'm sure a, boatload of money to get this thing going there down there in Disney World. I don't think ESPN or TNT or anyone that's broadcasting these games is all of a sudden just seeing the profits just pour in and they're bathing in cash over this thing. This was just to get the season completed and let these guys finish off. And obviously they didn't only do it for the players. I mean everyone uh it, you know got some benefit from finish the, finishing this thing off, but I know for those involved that that would be frustrating to see all that work, um, you know, just, just walked away from. So I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. Speaking of that, uh, we're recording this when the NBA player meeting is going on mm -hmm. uh, just for full disclosure sake. And Shams just put a tweet out that says, Sources, the Lakers and Clippers have voted to boycott the NBA season. Most other teams voted to continue. LeBron James has exited the meeting. He also adds, Miami's Udonis Haslam spoke and essentially told everyone in the room that without the Lakers and Clippers, how will the season continue? LeBron James walked out. The rest of the Lakers and Clippers exited behind him. And he also adds that every team besides the Lakers and Clippers voted to continue playing. Yeah, especially after the Lakers are gone. Let's go win a championship, boys. Yeah, did you Just see them the other saying. night? Did you see what they did to Portland the other night? Yeah, let's go win one. Um, well, here's the thing. How and does the NBA season go on without LeBron James? I mean, I mean it. That puts the other guys in, and once again, this, this just happened, so we'll see how this develops. It went on without him last year. That's a good point. That is you a good know, point, but. I, I hear what you're saying, but, I mean, here's the thing. A groin's a little different set of circumstances. That's true. Um, here's the thing. 
And this is why I think it was a major mistake for the NBA to meet tonight and have a vote tonight. It is way too fresh. Don't make an emotional decision. It yeah, is, that's a great point. This sleep thing on it. Is, yeah, sleep on it. Think about it. I know there's a ton of emotion built up right now, and people are angry and frustrated and, you know, all throw all of the different, you know, feelings in there that you want. It's not a good time to make a, a decision on the rest of the season. Um, talk, get it out there, get your feelings out there, uh, come back and vote on it tomorrow or the day after. But you knew what way that vote was going to go if they had it right now when everyone's hot. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, th there's part of me that thinks that that's the right decision. But there's also a large part of me that thinks that they, they have everyone's attention right now. I mean, they do. When they didn't play on Wednesday, like, they caught everyone's attention. It's national news. It was leading everything, right? And they do have this platform down there that I really think they can utilize. And I think that's the main reason they did the bubble in the first place. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. But I, I know these guys have their individual platforms and their brands and their social media platforms, all those things. But I, I think – I think that they should, could come together. Now, obviously, I want to see basketball. I want to see the season finished. I'm not going to lie. I mean, everyone, I think, wants to see the season finish. But I just think that if they can unify together down there a little bit and, you know, meet a little more, which I think was kind of the plan, but there's so many games and practices and all the things they're doing in the bubble. But I just think them there there is – a big advantage to all those guys being in one place and having that national television audience, even if the ratings aren't great. I, I just think that, I don't know why I think, I, I think they should, I think they should keep playing and I think they should use their platform because I do think people are more, more people are paying attention now. Now that's probably just the basketball fan and me speaking, honestly, but, and I don't understand what it's like to be black. I don't. So I, I, I'm not going to judge these guys either way, whether they play, whether they all leave. Um, yeah, it's just a, I mean, this, this is a historic moment in sports. That's what it is. Well, yeah, you know, it's, it, I know it's frustrating whenever, you know, everyone wants a voice and everyone wants, um, wants their opinion heard and wants their, their, their feelings heard and, you know, the best way to do it. And I, I don't know who said it, but they said, kneeling's not enough. Nobody's listening. So I think today the boycott got a, a lot of attention. Okay. And, and they control the, the conversation now about, well, are you going to come back and what's it going to take for you to come back? And uh, you demand change. What are those changes that you actually demand? And you know, what, what has to be done before you will come back? If you vote on not playing again, a walk out of the season, you lose all of that. So yeah. it's nothing. And no one listens anymore. And you you've taken all of your cards and thrown them on the table. And I don't know where else you go from that. You, you lose the, you lose the bargaining chip. You lose the upper hand. When it's folded, it's folded, and everyone just kind of goes on to the next situation, which would and, be the NFL. Right, and there is – there's obviously the social justice component of this. That's clearly playing a huge role. But you also have to acknowledge the financial component for the NBA. What does this do to their brand? What does it do to the salary cap next year, maybe the next couple of years? What does that do to the players and their salaries? How does that affect their ability 
to make a difference in their community, stuff like that. So, I mean, it's, there's just, I mean, there's so many factors. This, this is complex. It's, it's really complex. And I, I can only imagine what those conversations were like between those NBA guys. Whoa. I bet that was pretty, uh, pretty heated. The first thing, you know, I kind of, um, just to make light of the situation, I was like, imagine if it was two, two and LeBron with Portland and LeBron decided to, uh, vote to walk out of the, the he's season. scared of Dame Lillard. Exactly. Right. But I don't know, man. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, you know, I think LeBron may be shocked to find out that, in fact, the NBA can withstand him leaving. Yeah, maybe the uh, maybe the Clippers and Lakers are the Big Ten and Pac-12. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, when everyone else votes to stay and you walk out of the room and it's almost like the Jerry Maguire, who's coming with me, right? And – you get the Lakers is Renee Zellweger and off they go. You know, I, I don't know. It's, it's, if everyone stays and plays, LeBron will, you know, since he's LeBron, he'll obviously be, you know, still be relevant and everyone's still going to be picking his brain, but the NBA will go on. It went on without Michael Jordan. It'll go on. It went on without Kobe. It'll go on without LeBron James. Um, you know, but, I can't say whatever he's doing is right or wrong and what that's going to mean and what it's, it's ultimately going to accomplish. And is this going to bring uh change? Is it going to bring more people to the table to discuss what, um, what can, can be done or needs to be done? I don't know. We'll just have to, to see how that plays out. Well, there's a board of governors meeting in the morning, Thursday morning uh, for the NBA or- owners. So uh, I think that was probably a message to the owners. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. But we got to move on or else this is going to be the longest podcast in the history <laughs> of podcasts. Uh, let's move on to our winners and losers of the week. And winners and losers are brought to you by Advanced Weight Loss Clinic of Sand Springs. They'll help you execute a realistic and achievable weight loss plan designed for you and only you. They've got all kinds of treatments for men and women. Their licensed and trained experts combine diet and exercise with hormone therapies to maximize your results. If you're struggling with low libido or low energy, Advanced Weight Loss Clinic of Sand Springs can help with that too. They also offer Botox and fillers to get on the path to losing weight. Call 918-241-LOSE or visit their Facebook page. If you mention the podcast, you'll get a free fat burner injection from our friends at Advanced Weight Loss Clinic of Sand Springs. All right, Ted. Who do you have as your winner of the week? Winner of the week, and a lot of folks out there saying that this gentleman may be the the hero of the year, or uh, maybe as as long as we can remember back, Chad Little. Um, have you heard the name Chad Little yet? If not, you're going to. What this man did, simply amazing. California, as you know, has got some wildfires going on. Gay. Oh my and, gosh, they're horrible, dude. Right. Well, the the building that Chad Little lives in, um, the fire was bearing down on him. He goes to grab a water hose to to spray the fire and realizes because of the the fire, you know, and it's bearing in that the utilities are no longer working in the area. So to put out the fire, he grabs a thirty pack of Bud Light and finds a nail and starts puncturing cans and shaking the cans to spray the fire and puts the fire out with a 30 pack of Bud Light or at least keeps it at bay until firefighters arrive on the scene. Amazing. What? (laughs) I, I only hope, please tell me there's a video. Can I watch a video? I hope so. I haven't seen it yet. I, I just read the story online and um, it's either the greatest like marketing ploy for Bud Light ever or uh, I, I don't know. I'm funny. really impressed. <laughs> Would have been more impressed if it was Will and Wiley Hard Seltzer though. huh? huh? I, you know, I, I was thinking about that earlier and I was like, you know, Will and Wiley does have more than one use. You could also put out wildfires with it. 
I, I saw something yesterday that was like, it's as many acres in California. Like it's as the amount of acres on fire in California is like the size of Rhode Island or something. Wow. I don't know really how much well, you or how large we Rhode Island is, to, but that seems UCLA, big. UCLA, we like flew through the smoke and stuff. They were going on then too. And then obviously you had the, the stuff out in Malibu, which was really bad. But uh, Chad Little puts out the, uh, the wildfire with a 30-pack of Bud Light. Pretty amazing stuff. <laughs> That's that's You're awesome. Right. He could have hey, he could have just sat on the sidelines and watched everything burn, right? What right. Jerry Falwell Jr. style, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> what too soon? <laughs> too soon? That Perfect whole story. Timing. That that whole story. Oh my gosh, what in the world? But um, all right, to, to, let's move on. <laughs> let's move on from the Falwell Jr. stuff. And who's your loser of the week? It's Lamelo Ball. Oh, LaMelo Ball, uh, the youngest of the brothers. Uh, I think he's, he's still a teenager. I think he's like 19. He's been playing overseas. And sources say that he is signing a shoe deal, and it's imminent. And it's going to be with Puma. The shoe deal is with Puma. And... I'm just thinking like, you know, wear anything that you need to play some basketball, wait a couple years, do not sign a deal with Puma unless you're playing soccer. To, to LaMelo Ball's defense, which is a, the start of a sentence I never thought I would utter. Puma has made kind of a comeback in the basketball space. They've been signing a couple of, you know, early first round picks the last couple of years. And they've got a pretty vibrant shoe that seems to hold up kind of well. I thought you were going with the angle of he didn't sign with Big Baller Brand and he's not wearing his family shoes. I would rather sign with Big Baller Brand. Uh, oh. Well, yeah, that's probably a bit harsh, but all I'm saying is you don't have to sign right now. Don't sign some crappy deal with Puma. Go play some, get your name out there and sign a deal with, I'm sorry to Puma, but a legitimate basketball shoe company like Nike or Nike, or maybe you could sign with Nike. The only right. one, Nike, or it could lead to Jordan. Yeah, Puma? Are you kidding me? Man, no one's going to go buy Puma shoes. Don't do it. No one's going to do that. But what happens if they're paying him, like, a lot of money? Like, a lot. Which I that mean, you know they are, right? I mean, yeah, they're going to pay him a, a decent amount of money, but... Who cares? Wouldn't it be nice to see someone wearing uh, like Russell Westbrook's to see you, someone wearing your shoe or to see someone wearing a, a, a Kevin Durant for lack of a better name. No one will ever wear your shoe. If it's a Puma, it's not, it will never happen. It will never, ever happen ever. All right. You think I'm being too harsh? No, I don't. I think you're you right about the Puma. With me on Puma? I, no, I I think that I think that the price was probably I Can I would talk? not be surprised if and I'm not sure. I bet he's getting over thirty million from him, maybe fifty. I know Marvin Bagley got a bag from them. I mean, supposedly Marvin Bagley's deal was like the biggest one since Durant signed with Nike when he came into the league. Okay, that's a bunch of money they're shelling out for shoes. You know what has to fund those big deals that they've got that are 10-year deals? Shoe sales. And you know what's not going to sell? Their shoes. You know who has a <laughs> chance of not being able to get their full contract? LaMelo Ball and Bagley because Puma can't pay it anymore and have to get out of their shoe deals. Well, maybe they sell lots of soccer cleats <laughs> to pay for their basketball shoe losses. Maybe so. All right, Maybe my so. my winner of the week, golf fans, which obviously Ooh. pertains to you, Teddy, because this right. came out according to Forbes, 
a new international competition is coming our way, and it is called the Paynes Valley Cup. And it's soon, September 22nd. In fact, it'll be Tiger Woods and Justin Thomas against Rory McIlroy and Justin Rose at Payne's Valley, which is at Big Cedar Lodge in the Ozarks in Missouri. You ever heard of it, Ted? I was just there, baby. You did the Too show bad. from your car there, which was hilarious. <laughs> it's it, The course there, it's also it's the first public course Tiger Woods has designed and it'll be the grand opening of that course. And the coolest part, the proceeds will benefit the Payne Stewart Family Foundation. I'm all about the 2v2 format in golf. What's the format? So what, what exactly is it going to be like multiple there was, days, multiple rounds? It was, it was short on those details. I can't imagine they just play. Maybe it's one. I, I would love for it to just be 18 holes. and uh, But who knows? But... Maybe it'll be kind of like the thing with Brady and Peyton Manning. I, I'm not entirely sure. I didn't see those details. But I'm I'm all for more of this stuff, especially you throw it in. It's it there for charity? Come on. I mean, this is awesome. Here's, here's what I would love to see. I would love to see, like, uh, a morning 18 where they play um, – you know, low ball or whatever, where it's, you know, they just take low score on the hole. Um, and then I'd like to see maybe like a uh, match play or something where it's, you know, Tiger versus Rory or, or however they decide to do that. And then on one round, I would love to see a two man scramble. That would be, dude, I, watching professionals everyone, in a scramble would be unbelievable. I agree. And I don't, I've never seen it before, and I'm sure there's someone could point me to where some guys played in a scramble. But to see like Rory and Justin Rowe, like a scramble would be like so cool between those. How four about guys. how about this? They play, you know, like you're like you're saying, low ball in the morning, and then they live stream them eating dinner and drinking a bunch, <laughs> and then they play a scramble. Yeah, a drunk scramble. A drunk scramble. Oh, Love that would be awesome. I, watching professional golfers play in a scramble format would probably just make us all very depressed. <laughs> We'd all be like, oh, my God. oh, yeah, these guys are incredible. Let's see. Should we take yours that's four feet or mine that's uh, five feet but uphill? It's like, come on, guys. Unbelievable. That would be I think awesome. Yours, I think yours is a little easier, a little less break. Yeah, okay, cool, guys. All right, my I'll loser. Yeah. Thanks, JT. Oh, man, he's going to drop so many F-bombs, and it's for charity. It's going to be awesome. All right, my loser of the week, and I I really did consider going with that 33-year-old over in Hong Kong that's gotten coronavirus twice this year, which, I mean, it was – What a but, loser. What a loser. But it's, uh, it's, it wasn't sports-related. So I, I'm going to go with this. The loser of the week – defensive linemen that are on the fringe of the roster for the New York Giants. Let me explain. We've talked about Joe Judge a little bit on here, and we're still giving him the benefit of the doubt because the New York Giants haven't played any football games. We don't know if his methods are going to work. But the legend of Joe Judge continues to grow because allegedly, first, he made his defensive back his defensive backs tape tennis balls to their hands so that they couldn't hold in coverage, which, okay, but what happens if, like, a guy wants to intercept the ball or if he, like, sets his hand on the ground and, like, breaks his wrist because he's got a tennis ball attached to it? I have questions, but that's not the one I'm really concerned about. But he came out and said that he's considering taking Daniel Jones's red non-contact jersey away during practice. Now, he said they're not going to put him in any Royal Rumbles. That's a quote. <laughs> but he also said, quote, at some point, we want to prepare his body for what it'll take in the first game. My question is. Kind of like they did in the Patriots with Tom Brady. He used to not wear the, the red jersey, right? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> my question is, this puts the – defensive linemen that are on the fringe of the roster for the New York Giants 
in essentially the worst position you can be in as a football player in the National Football League. Teddy, what is the number one rule for a defensive lineman in an NFL practice? Stay off the quarterback. Number one rule, you ask any football player that has played in that league, they will tell you the exact same thing. That is the number one rule for everyone involved in the practice. Stay off the quarterback. Don't touch the quarterback. Don't get near him. Don't even think about touching him. If you're a rookie, like undrafted guy, and you touch the quarterback, you get absolutely ripped. If you're a rookie free agent guy and you touch the quarterback again, you get cut. And there was that report, right, that someone knocked Tom Brady down at the Buccaneers practice? Yeah, that guy probably got fired. Like, <laughs> that, that's how it works. That's the rule. So for Joe Judge to come out and say, yeah, we want him to get hit a little bit, if you're a defensive lineman that's not established for the Giants, what do you do? Because you've been trained now in the practice setting. Like, you don't hit your quarterback. Like, you just don't because that's your starting quarterback. I don't know if anyone knows this, but having a good quarterback is pretty important when it comes to winning games in the National Football League. But you also want to make the team. So what does that guy do? Like, if you beat an offensive tackle, boom, beat him with an inside move, free shot on Daniel Jones. Are you just going to light his ass up? Like, like do you go tag him? Like, I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I do. If I'm playing linebacker, I drop into coverage, right? I, I, I've got a guy behind me. I've got my eyes on the quarterback. Jones steps up in the pocket. Uh, doesn't find anyone, tucks it and scrambles it, and here I come. I'm flying at him. I'm going full speed. He doesn't have a colored jersey on. I am flying right past him and not touching him. No, nope. smart man. Smart. I mean, what do you? What's the coach going to say? Come on, man! Annihilate our quarterback. What? No, I'm flying by. I'm not even going to touch him. It. And that's coming from you. I'm flying like, by. The worst thing that happens is the coach says, why you got to make that? this play. And I'm going to say, I would have made that play if it's a game. I'm not tackling our quarterback. If I tackle him and he puts his arm down to brace himself and breaks his elbow or falls on his collarbone and breaks his collarbone. on his shoulder and separates his AC joint with, like right. we see all the time with quarterbacks. Like, I don't care about being fined. I don't care about getting kicked off the team. I want to do this thing called win. I want our quarterback on the team. I want to win. If you want to rough him up, let the quarterbacks go hit each other. They're not going to hurt one another. <laughs> oh, you know who their backup is? Colt uh, McCoy. Yeah, still hanging on. Still yeah. hanging on, baby. And my boy take Alex Candy's there, too. If you take that jersey off Colt McCoy, all it takes is just a little bit of contact. As bad as that concussion was with him, I think he's right back in protocol. For the oh, rest gosh. of his life. That was, Any, anytime <laughs> he takes his shot. So, I remember watching that. And so like, brutal. I think oh, he's dead. I think that, he's dead. That's one of those moments where you're like, dude, yeah, football, yeah, football cannot be fun sometimes. <laughs> All right, Ted, let's move on to everyone's favorite segment, and that is keeping it local, where we highlight what's going on in the great state of Oklahoma. And keeping it local is brought to you by Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School. As schools are reopening in the fall, parents want to provide the best possible educational experience and spiritual development for their children. There's no better place for that than Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School, a one-to-one -one iPad setting. Makes McGinnis students feel fully prepared to continue high-level learning from home. A 12-to-1 student-to-teacher ratio guarantees no student is overlooked. In addition to athletic programs and clubs, Bishop McGinnis' college prep curriculum offers 22 AP courses. Financial aid is available. For more information, visit bmchs.org. All right. So I was looking for, for things, and I stumbled upon this. And you are an outdoors guy, Ted. You're also one of the more active 
human beings I know. And I, I just wanted to know if you're in or out on this. It's official. You can surf in Oklahoma now. And I know there's some guys out there that maybe kite surf on Lake Hefner and they're like, oh, we already surf. Like, okay, calm down. But Surf OKC officially opens to the public at Riversport Rapids here in Oklahoma City on Saturday. This is a $1.8 million dual surfing machine. Now, I assume this is kind of like the ones that are on the really nice cruise ships. Right. That's kind of what I have in my head. Same. So are you in or are you out? Surf OKC dual surfing machine. I'm totally in. I would do this, no I doubt. I knew you would now, be. Here's the thing. I don't give everyone – I've never done this, but I'm going to give everyone some free advice. Before you go out there, before it's your turn – Make sure your shorts are tied on, okay? Um, you have to tie your shorts on. I is think, there – it seems like there's a story here, if I've, I had to guess. I've seen numerous videos where a gentleman falls in – basically what it is, it's a little – it's like a – it's a pad that's got like a mound in it, and then there's a tremendous amount of water that – is rolling up towards and over this mound, and it just creates a, a wave. Well, if you fall, you fall into this massive stream of water. And if the shorts aren't on, Gabe, they're coming off. And I don't mean they're coming down. I mean, they are coming off, and they are going over the mound, and they are out of the, uh, out of the park. I, I'm just asking. I, I'm asking for a friend. What do we think the uh, water temperature is going to be like uh, there at Surf OKC? Uh, lukewarm, or is it going to be possibly a, a little chilly? I'd say chilly. I'd say chilly. Not good. Not good. That's, that's not well, a, that's, those aren't good conditions to um, represent yourself well. Yeah. It's probably the best way to put it. So, I'd, yeah, I'd, if I'd wear shorts that you can tie on, and I'd m maybe wear tights underneath that, and maybe uh, tape them to your legs. I don't know whatever you've got to do, but make sure you're protected. I'd hate to see someone out there uh, uncovered. Yeah, um, that would be that would be an interesting situation, and I can't imagine that'll happen. There's no way that happens. <laughs> It'll be fine. That's going to happen like the first happen. five people that go. I, I, I imagine it'll happen within the first week, probably. Well, hopefully someone gets a video of it. Does that make me a bad person? It's on their, their Facebook Live. Hey, Facebook Live, and we're just getting going out here at the uh, Surf OKC. Oh, here goes a gentleman right now. Look how much fun that is. Oh, my God. <laughs> Turn it off. Turn the camera off. Turn it off. We're live. I know. Turn it off. All right, Ted, episode 37 in the books. Now we'll have a new podcast that will drop Monday morning. Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 2 to 6 on Sports Talk 1400, and you can hear me on Sirius XM Big 12 Radio, Channel 375. Hope you all have a great weekend. Until next time, we appreciate you all for listening, and do what you always do, Oklahoma.